What's up, everybody? This is Grant, I Cause Artist. Welcome to another episode of the Disruptors for Good podcast. Today, we're going to chat with Shireen Jaffer, the co-founder and CEO of Edvo, which is a venture-backed education startup that empowers people with the tools to think better and live better through a different variety of, of mental model tools, educational tools to, to really dive deep into an edu- your educational journey throughout your life. It's, it's really, really interesting. She has an amazing background of about a decade of building out educational systems and platforms for recent graduates and executives. She's amazing what she has done within her her early years of her life. She's a Forbes 30 under 30 recipient. She's helped over 50,000 people in their careers over the last 10 years. She's also worked with hundreds of companies from Fortune 500s to early stage startups. She's also an active angel investor and an advisor at Pay It Forward Venture Capital. And she's also the host of the Edvolution podcast, which I'll link to below. It's an amazing conversation about education and lifelong learning, something I'm passionate about now, something I've never been passionate about before growing up. Education was something I hated. Learning was something I hated. I, I just didn't, it just didn't click for me, right? I think millions and millions, perhaps billions of people around the world feel the same way. But over the last, you know, I would say decade or so, I've, I've really loved learning fell in love with learning, just access to the internet has allowed people to to teach people creatively and, and you know, teach people in different ways. Um, so I, I fell in love with education and learning, and it's something I hope to dedicate time to the rest of my life. And I think what Shireen has done is, is really powerful. From just a, a very early age, she has really looked at education uh, as, a, as a way to develop a skill set and to look at education as a way to adapt to the world and, and put yourself in a position to live the life you want to live. And look, it's just uh, it's a powerful conversation. And I really enjoyed her journey and her opening up and sharing a lot of detail, you know, about her background and kind of moving over from Pakistan as a, as a young child and having a, to live in a country and, and not know, obviously, the atmosphere around you and, and be sort of an outsider at the, at the outset. Uh, so I, I'm really very thankful that she did that and took the time to, to open up about a lot of these things. So I hope you guys enjoyed the conversation. Hope you're staying safe and staying healthy. And we'll talk soon. Thanks. So usually how I like to, to start these conversations is is about an individual's journey and sort of the roadmap they take to get to where they are in their life. And usually I speak to people who are, you know, are building big things that, that will sort of take up a, a big chunk of their life. <laughs> so I want to I wanna take people through your, your sort of background because you've been in sort of ed tech like accidentally really since like almost like a decade now, it seems like. Kind of walk us through maybe we could start around Skillify, maybe tell us what, what that is, how that got started, and, and then we'll kind of and then we'll kind of go from there and, and touch on a bunch of different subjects. Yeah, I mean, you said it right. <laughs> uh, something that you spend a big, large chunk of your time doing for me is definitely education. And mm-hmm. while I didn't think I would build a career in education, because when you're little, you literally think having a career in education is being a teacher. And I love teachers, but I never really saw myself being a teacher. And so I didn't think of a career in education, but that said, I don't think I really accidentally fell into it either. Because now when I reflect on my journey, which we'll of course talk about, education has been at the core of pretty much everything that makes me me. All right, so let's get into it. Uh, (laughs) So I was born in Pakistan and education there is not good by any means. And so when I was seven, my parents worked really hard. I mean, I think they were trying to get a visa to Canada, to America, to, I think at one point they were considering Singapore or Thailand. I mean, they were just trying to get us out of Pakistan to another country that really valued education for their kids. So it was my brother and I. And so at seven, we were very fortunate to moved to Palo Alto of all places, which is insane because (laughs) immigrants, especially from a country like Pakistan, they're not moving to this like affluent suburbia that's primarily at the time was primarily white and Asian. Um, That was not heard of, right? They're moving to densities like LA, Houston, Chicago and whatnot. So we got moved because my mom is a healthcare professional and she got sponsored by a healthcare facility. Hmm. Now it was my mom, my brother and I. Um, So my brother and I were minors and so we could go with my mom, but my dad had to wait. He had to wait until his visa came in. Mm -hmm. And so he was, you know, we were told that nine months later he'd be able to join us. And then 9-11 happened. Oh my God. Yeah. Yeah. And 
everything got halted and my dad was stuck in Pakistan for five years. Oh my God. Yeah. So I grew up real quick because here I am, the seven-year-old that's watching my mom in this city where we have no family. We don't even have people who look like us around us, right? So she's just trying to do what she can. And it's my brother and I, and and, um, she's working three jobs. So I knew from a pretty young age that unlike my friends who lived in beautiful homes and went to summer camp and had all these opportunities around them, (laughs) My mom had no time to make friends, let alone connect right. for me to, you know, find mentors with them. So long story short, I started working when I was 14. And what inspired that was um, my eighth grade counselor who sat me down before I was entering high school and said, all right, Shireen, let's sign you up for all these after school programs because we have to pad your college resume, right? Because college is stuffed down your throat in, in middle school. <laughs> and I looked at her and I said, I'm sorry, this is like $10,000 a month to do all these after school programs. Like, what do you mean? I need, or I think it was $10,000 a semester, actually. Um, It was ridiculous. I mean, for (laughs) us, it was like, we're not paying for all this stuff. And she was like, but you have to. Like, this is how you're going to get into college. Didn't your parents bring you here for a good quality education? You have to go to college. And I, at the time, now, of course, I'm very opinionated about college. But at the time, I thought, okay, well, I can't afford it. So that's not going to happen. I didn't have anyone helping me with scholarships and things. I didn't know about that then. Um, So I just started working. And I did everything from, I think my first job was in real estate. I was pretending to be an 18-year-old. I got it through just like a really sweet woman that was in my religious center that, you know, wanted to support us. I just was tall and (laughs) I just got to like do all these open houses. And that's where I learned how to communicate and how to talk to adults and how to be confident. Um, And then I worked at a frozen yogurt place and then I worked in the Kmart and then I worked, I shadowed at a tech company. And then I, I did like so much stuff from the age of 14 through 18. And I got into college and remember Grant, I was doing all of this to keep up with my friends, right? To get into a good college, to like pad up my resume, because I thought my friends had all these opportunities they were taking advantage of. But then I went to USC in LA and I was a freshman there and I realized I hadn't just kept up, I had totally exceeded the Mm. expectations put on an 18 year old because my friends the entire time in high school were just focused on their grades and their test scores. They weren't getting out there. They were so nervous to talk to adults. Mm. They didn't know how to network. And all of a sudden you're in college being pressured to choose a major, you know, and you're told that that major will define the jobs you'll get, which is not true. You're, you're, you're pressured to get internships, but no one tells you what an internship is or how to even build a resume. And so, you know, at 18, I said, okay, let me literally, I started a summer project and I said, okay, let me just teach my friends how to have, how to build a resume, how to get an internship. Right. And I did these summer camps and this is really just the start of Skillify to go to your, you know, question is that's really where skill if I started is it started with me recognizing that there was this huge pain point and I saw my friends struggling with ridiculously high levels of anxiety loss of like self-worth um insecurities all this stuff and I was like what the hell all they need to know is how to find a mentor and get an internship and they won't feel this way why is this not taught and so I started skillify um at that point and yeah, that start that kick started my entrepreneurial journey at 19 years. Yeah, it's crazy. It was so interesting, kind of looking at at your path because you've now sort of you know founded you know ed tech companies and also invested in, in, in some as well. And so you've kind of have the background of, of both sides of of the spectrum of of what founders deal with when trying to to start something, right? But then also from an investor point of view of what you look for in, in companies. And uh, I think now, as we obviously are in this time of just uncertainty, right, across all sectors, but we we know education is in, I think, a crossroads. And I think it's it's almost an opportunity, I think, to change a lot of this, the systematic wrongdoings that I I think that have been embedded in, in the system for so long as you sort of went through, right? It's like, well, if you can't afford college, and it's like before there was just no way else, you just had to get a job earlier and that was it. You could go to trade schools and things like that. But for some, for most really, I, I would say college is not, it, it's just not on their radar because, you know, one, if the, your community around you doesn't look at it that way, like you have to go to college, like some areas that doesn't, that 
that's not what you know your train your mindset is trained to be right it could be trained to get a job right or or do something else kind of depending on you know the community around you and then some it's it's really more pressurized like you have to do this and you have to do that and then you have like those people like what if they were they were buying they were buying off teachers to get scholarships to like some colleges like in la right it's like that's the pressure and that's the system that it creates it's just like there has to be a better way right well i argue i think the fundamental issue that we're facing as a society is what we believe what we think educated means yeah right? how do we define being educated in our society and i'd say you know i think having worked with nationwide in the states um you know skillify over six years we worked with over 220 schools and we were working with multiple states and we were working with the um you know the united states department of education and i would argue that most places, college is really emphasized, right? Mm -hmm. Every state has a college, every, almost every city has right. a college and some sort of college. And so I think, you know, we've, in our education system, we have made people believe that being educated means having a degree or some sort of credential, right. which really, like, if you really break it down, what does that mean? We're telling people, we've led people to believe that being educated means someone giving you a stamp of approval <laughs> that you know enough. And so everything I've done in my career is, is really pushing back on the sense of external validation that is embedded in us, right? In grade school, right? Where we're constantly working to impress our teachers, right? Mm -hmm. They give us our grades. They tell us if we right. have or not. Um, we're relying on these textbooks that were written God knows when by God knows who, but we're relying them on them to tell us what to learn, mm -hmm. right? And what to think and what perspective to even learn it from. I think something that in my adulthood really got to me, I was talking to my husband about this. We're both passionate about education. He dropped out of college. I went the traditional route, but it, he grew up in LA and in his classroom in LA, which is the school he was part in was primarily brown and black, right? Full of like minorities. And so what he was learning in his classes and the perspective he was learning it from was so different mm -hmm. than what I was learning in my very white classroom. And so you start thinking about who are you giving the permission to educate you? Mm -hmm. And why do we constantly give everyone else the permission to educate us instead of really relying on ourselves to self-educate, right? And yeah. to, um, and I'm not saying don't listen to what people are saying, of course, get a variety of perspectives, identify what Grant is saying, what Trina is saying, what mm -hmm. everyone else is saying. But I tell people, if you're only listening to what I'm saying, if you're wholeheartedly trusting me to educate you, to tell you what opinion to have, because you value my opinion. If you're only valuing mine, you're doing yourself injustice because you need to develop your own perspective. And the only way to do that is by getting a ton of perspectives <laughs> and then thinking through them, right? And sitting with them and, and based on your context and your reality, asking yourself, well, what feels true to you? And truth is very different um, depending on who you talk to. So I think that's the fundamental problem in our society is we have completely misguided the definition of being educated in our world and it shows by the way right we say credentials and degrees mean you're educated yet at the same time people can't get jobs with those degrees and they're what they learned in the classroom isn't actually helping them in the real world so the data already shows that's a terrible definition and people's experiences already show that's a terrible definition yet i think we're so scared um and i think COVID has changed a lot of this but i think pre-COVID, people, I think there were a handful of people that were speaking up against these institutions, mm -hmm. right? And these institutional narratives around education and our belief sets and how we should live and what she would what we should eat. But I think now post-COVID, people have really seen the amount of misinformation that is being given to them and the confusion and how our you know, different institutions are reacting to this like thing that doesn't make any sense to a lot of people. <laughs> um, and so more important than ever, now is the time to start thinking for ourselves and to redefine what it means for you as an individual to be educated so you can thrive in a very fast changing world. That's what it means in my opinion to be educated is when you believe you have the skills, the capabilities, the confidence 
confidence is very important. It's not just about, you know, like a hard skill. It's when you understand and know and believe that you can thrive in any type of world and you have the skill sets to adjust with time. That's what it means to be educated, in my opinion. 100%. I think we, we now look at, well, I personally look at education as not like a four-year thing, right? I think we were taught, a lot of us were, were taught, I guess, is like, oh, you go to college, right? And then you get a job that, so that, that four years, then you're just like done with learning, right? And it's like, no, it's really, if you look at it, like, I'm going to take the next 60 years of my life to learn, right? And then you can determine, like you said, what do you want to learn? right? All these different resources out there. Now we can learn what we want. I always tell everybody, you want to learn something, just go buy a Udemy class for 1999 and immerse yourself in something and see if you're passionate about it. And if you are, then maybe take next steps to go, you know, get a higher level thing or, or, or go down the path of really immersing yourself in that subject matter. And I think it might not be like the system is broken, but rather the curriculum that is t being taught needs to be upgraded it, it, is that when you that's why i like the skillify so much because we don't really learn skills in traditional education paths we, we learn about like history right and we learn about like science and, and all these subject matters that yes they matter you don't really get a skill from knowing who the general was in the civil war it i think it's fine to know these things right but like how does that help us with providing for our family and like changing aspects of society, you know, and, and understanding technology more and actually having a skill set that you can thrive in different environments and be a chameleon, right? Yeah. Like just live in, in, in different rooms, whether it's rich, whether it's poor, whether it's white, whether it's brown, whether it's black, like you need to be able to live in any arena with the skill sets you obtain over a long period of time, not just your time in high school or college. Right. Well, you brought up two interesting points. Um, one, when it comes to skills, yeah, I think our, again, our, our, in our classrooms, we are told what to learn, not how to learn, right? Mm -hmm. How to learn is a skill. And I think, Great you point. know, yeah. going back to our curriculum, there is so much beauty in knowing, for example, history, right? Mm -hmm. And because life repeats itself, things are cyclical, there are trends, but we are not taught how to leverage our history right. to make sense of our current world, right? And that's a skill. And so memorizing facts and who did what, uh, it's, it's really, I feel, well, first memorization, I think it's just silly. You're just putting all this stuff <laughs> in your brain and it takes up space and right. prevents you from learning things you actually want to learn. So, you know, one thing that we can talk about later if you want is the act of unlearning, which is really mm -hmm. important and not talked about often, but we'll come back to that. You know, memorization, I think, is is just unfortunate. And I found, and, and when you talk about curriculum, coming as a curriculum expert, something I've found is build a curriculum for the interests of the people learning it. Mm -hmm. Because if they're interested, if it if it vibes with them, they will memorize the heck out of whatever they want to memorize. If 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 it's a memorizing thing, right? <laughs> you memorize it. Um, but you're you're motivated when it's relevant. That's the biggest thing. So know the people that are wanting to learn from you. And so when I talk, I'm constantly talking to people that love learning. They're lifelong learners. They care about thinking better. They care about making better decisions. They they care about being more self-reliant, right? Those are my people. We talk about all sorts of stuff. And so that brings me to my second point that you mentioned is lifelong learning, right? You said it's not just about learning up until college and then getting a job. It's for the next 60 years of my life. Yeah. Lifelong learning has become this like very trendy word, which is sad because it's not a trend. Mm -hmm. It simply is, mm -hmm. right? Lifelong mm -hmm. learning simply is. Um, if you look at anyone that has really been able to build a life that feels fulfilling to them at any age, it's because they've adapted and they've adjusted and they've changed their own reality and they've changed their outlooks. And that requires a ton of lifelong learning and unlearning to be able to do so. Explain yeah. what explain what unlearning is, because that's yeah. an interesting term. Yeah. So I, you know, in school, um, as we grow up in our, in our, in our, even as adults, a lot of people are told this is right. This is wrong. Right. We are told these like hard truths and we make them our own and we just don't question them because why would you question 
whether the sky is blue or not, right? Like, why is it question that? It just, like, is. But the problem is, if you really dig deep into where those truths came from, a lot of times, right? I'm not saying for everything, but more often than not, you will find that they started with an observation. They started within a specific context. They started, you know, there, there, there's a, a wealth of context behind it that may not be applicable to today's world anymore. Mm-hmm. And so unlearning is what I do as a personal, um, on a personal note, is I believe every few months, um, I do this like every four to six months, I'll kind of look and do a reflection on, all right, in the last four to six months, what have I learned? What do I truly believe in? Hmm. What are the truths that I have adopted, right? And this could be like hard, they've been my truths for years, 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 or they're new, I just learned about them. Right. My question, is this still true today? Hmm. And if it's not, right, if I find evidence that it's not, so for example, um, this is very applicable to what you eat, right? Right. Um, Because the way our food is processed and manufactured, it has changed significantly in just the last 10 years, right? for sure. Um, If you look at life expectancy of people in America in the early 1900s, that's like, you know, 100 years ago, it was like 35 and 40. I mean, 120 years ago, you were looking at a life expectancy that's half of what it is today. So the world is changing ridiculously fast. So you've got to question, is this still true today? And you'll find, especially COVID, right? What was true before COVID (laughs) versus now, just in these four months, the entire reality has changed. And so when you start questioning, you'll realize, oh, well, that's not true. I need to unlearn this. Mm -hmm. I need to Mm -hmm. remove this from my belief set, right? I need to get this out of the way. And by the way, this isn't just applicable to things in your life, but about yourself too, your own limiting beliefs. You know, the person I used to be six years ago, five years ago, one year ago, six months ago is so different than the person I am today. So there might be things I believe about myself. Oh, I'm this type of person, or I like these things, or I don't like these things. And when you start self-reflecting and realizing, oh, that's not true anymore. I need to unlearn that. Because once you unlearn it, you can then make room for new realities, for new truths. And so I like to, I love saying this, it's actually from a book I was reading. I like to, in my little head, (laughs) uh, very big head, I like to literally tag everything um, as mostly right. Never as right or wrong. Like it's never Mm -hmm. always right or always wrong, which is what we're taught in school. It's more just mostly right. Because when I tag anything as mostly right, it is inviting me to question it later and ask, is this still mostly right today? And if it's not, cool. I can unlearn it. (laughs) And if it is, great. I'll question it again six months later. I I wanted to touch on something you you mentioned a little bit earlier with with, uh, Skillify and maybe eventually... Edvo, we'll see how it, it it expands. But you said you had some, you talked with some uh, like Department of Education, right, and and some other sort of entities. Like, what what sort of the conversations like with them, and like what do, what do they like want to learn? Are they open to doing things differently, right? Like, is are, are they looking to modernize? So whether it's curriculum or, or whether it's how kids learn, I think that's also important. Is that we're just everybody learns so differently, right? It's so, and it's so hard to one teacher to teach, you know, 25 kids the same exact way and all of them to retain the same information the same way. So just what were some of those conversations like when you speak with sort of, you know, individuals who are at, who are at the forefront on the front lines of education every day? So it's interesting. Now I feel like there's two questions. So when you say the front lines of education, I would not say those are the institutions, right? Okay. I think the people on the front lines of education are teachers. But, they, people- but they're on the front lines of, because they dictate curriculum though, right? At a state level, uh, at a federal level, right? Like teachers don't get to choose what curriculum they want to teach. Yeah, so every, so let me first answer your first part of the question and then I'll talk a little bit more about curriculum in, 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 in specific. As I started working with more and more systems and institutions, Mm -hmm. because this isn't about people, you know, this people just end up, if you're in a system long enough, you become who you are around. That's just the reality of it, unfortunately. When, When I started working with systems and large institutions, I very quickly learned that you've got to follow the money. 
And mm. what I mean by that is if you really want to understand what someone is motivated by and why they're making certain decisions and why they're having certain discussions, look at where the money is coming from. And that's called trace routing, right? So trace route to identify what's the source of the money. And as I was having these conversations, a majority of the sources were coming from universities. A lot of these institutions are getting funded by colleges, by universities, by people who are incentivized to have more people pay tuition uh, at these institutions, right? right? And if that's the case, then almost every discussion I was a part of was around college readiness. Hmm. Always about get our kids into college. And the research always was, well, going to college increases your chances of getting a job, increases your chances of um, an employer wanting you because all these companies require college degrees. And then you wonder, well, why do these companies require college degrees? And then you realize, oh, well, the decision makers all went to Stanford and Harvard and all, like they were indoctrinated right. with that system. Right. Right. And now, now a lot of college or a lot of companies don't require college degrees because you have this in, and and I really believe what sparked that change was you got all these people um, within the tech bubble that dropped out of college yep. and showed that hey a college degree doesn't have to define your success so why do we keep asking people to have college degrees right mm -hmm. so that really changed that sentiment a little bit so to answer your first question I. Initially, when I first entered as a naive 19 year old, <laughs> um, I, you know, I would hear college readiness and I would see all these research studies and I would be like, oh yeah, people should go to college. But then I was like, wait, but I come, you know, I was embedded in these communities where I realized pushing our kids to test take and go to college, you're telling them that their worth is defined by them going to a university. Like it just right. didn't sit well with me. It was such a dissonance. Right. What really sealed the deal for me and what really started ask, what really made me question why are all these conversations around college? And then I trace rooted and I, you know, I found the answers. But what inspired that questioning was I um so growing up in Palo Alto, there were a lot of discussion around teenage suicides. Yeah. And um, if you Google it, you'll find a ton of articles. I mean, it was all people could talk about when I was in college and in my earlier years in university. And I remember talking to someone and reading this, I can't remember, it was an article or, you know, I don't know what it was, honestly, but it was around this guy who had committed suicide um, and he was 18 years old. And mm -hmm. one of the suicide notes that were found was that he didn't get admission into UC Davis. Mm -hmm. And it, you know, and, and I'll be, I'll, I'll, I'll put a disclaimer out. I don't know if that story is true, mm -hmm. right? I, I don't know. Um, and I'm, I'm not trying to spread it, but the reason why I'm honestly saying that, whether it was true or a rumor, it hit me so hard that I started thinking about, wait, hold on, it, do other people feel this way? Do they feel that their value of their life is defined by their degree, by where they go to college? And then I started talking to people and I started talking to my high school kids when I was working at Skillify and yes, it was absolutely true. That is exactly what people wow. were valuing their life with, right? <laughs> And so that made me start questioning, especially for my brown and my black kids, like, man, like what these kids need is empowerment. What every kid needs, by the way, it actually doesn't even matter where they come from, but every kid needs is empowerment. I do tell them that it actually doesn't matter, you know, what system you end up playing with them. If you have self-confidence and if you have the initiative to learn the skill sets, to talk to people, to put yourself out there, to learn for yourself what the real world demands. Mm -hmm. Right, and then to decide which demand you want to fulfill, <laughs> um, and because you don't have to do everything the real world tells you, obviously. So that's that's why I started Skillify, and that's when I started questioning um, a lot of the systems I was I was talking to, and then talking about people on the forefront. When it comes to curriculum, you know, at Skillify, I created all the curriculum, my team created all the curriculum, and we were creating curriculum by truly first and foremost talking to people in the real world, to mm -hmm. industry 
leaders, right? Mm -hmm. to, to people that are working every single day in the real world and asking them, what are the trends you're noticing? What skills do you feel like people need to start their careers and to build meaningful careers? Um, what type of traits do you look for? What type of traits do you feel like make someone successful in this, you know, right. rapid environment and we took all that information and research and data and we use that to power our curriculum and that's why i think you know we were so damn successful as far as engagement as far as student outcomes learning outcomes i mean it was addicting to you know have these 14 through 17 year olds in our skillify classes and they come in at 8 a.m and they're timid and they're shy and they're like oh my gosh not another guest speaker what the hell am i doing here right, right. and then they leave at 6 p.m because wow. we used to do these like eight hour conferences and they would leave at 6 p.m completely changed you could wow. see it in their face. You could see it in the way they carried themselves. You could see it in the hope they had because now they said, whoa, you mean I don't need to just worry about my grades and my sports all the time? You mean there's a chance where I can just talk to people and I can put myself out there and find what I actually like? Right. It was a completely different world. And so curriculum is an interesting thing because what really happens is most um, cities, most districts will have their own like director of curriculum. They, they sit in the district, they're in charge of ensuring the curriculum gets developed and gets you know, sent to the actual schools within the district. But you're right in the sense that who decides, who gives them the guidance of what's good curriculum versus bad, it does come from the state typically. And, you know, the and also national like common core requirements and whatever the hell, um, I'm not in the high school space anymore. So I honestly don't know how much it's changed, but um, whatever the core requirements are defined for that year, for that decade, yeah. um, they're in charge of ensuring they literally have a checklist and they check things off. Does the mm -hmm. curriculum have all these different things? And I was very fortunate when I started Skillify where the guidance coming down was college and career readiness. <laughs> and Skillify, you know, we started as college readiness in the sense that honestly, to just get teachers and parents and students in the door, you know, we were saying, well, like college admissions is competitive. We were kind of like feeding into the system, unfortunately, at the time. But, you know, college admissions is competitive. So if you have an internship, you'll stand out. And that got thousands of people <laughs> but once they were in the door we said yes that's true yes you could totally leverage skillify and everything you learn and get be very competitive for college but that's not the point the point is for you to figure out what makes most sense for you after you graduate high school and to just have skills whether you choose to go to college or whether you don't or whatever you choose to do you have the skills you need for the rest of your life because networking is a skill you need for the rest of your life. Being able to find mentors you need for the rest of your life. So we filled those check boxes. Um, <laughs> that's how I think we got so successful so early by being embedded in these schools is because all these beautiful, you know, director of curriculum people said, cool, you know, this is good. This is, this is based on the guidance coming down. And even though the guidance was incentivized by something totally different, it allowed Skillify to do what it did. But then it also cost Skillify detriment later on because then career readiness and college readiness funding for it totally got cut. Right. right? So you're forever relying on, but, but just because the funding got cut doesn't mean the people on the ground, the kids on the ground, the teachers on the ground, it doesn't mean they needed it any less. They only needed it more. Right. And so then you start realizing, wow, our education system and the education you get is totally dependent on someone up there making decisions, incentivized by money, incentivized by politics, and that completely dictates your livelihood. So why the hell do we rely on these systems? to define how we're going to thrive and what we need to know in order to actually thrive in this world. I guess all this would lead us to <laughs> all your all your journeys and, and, and sort of skills that you've gained, right? And sort of your information overload within the space the last, let's say, decade for, for ease, ease of time is, is Envo. And, and I know we had lightly touched on it before in, in some of our previous conversations, but let's let's kind of take a deep dive right now and, and uh, tell us like what Edvo is and, and I guess how did that come to be and, and like why why was it important for you to sort of start this at, at this point? Yeah, so Edvo's mission is to uh, help you think for yourself and forge your own story. And what that really means, right, forging your own story, it's really identifying what type of life you want to live. 
what type of career you want to build and being able to just do it yourself and right. not feeling this insecurity that you have to rely on someone to tell you how to do that. Right. And, you know, again, everything that I did in, in the schools, in education and developing curriculum is recognizing everything I did helped me recognize, well, we've done a really terrible job teaching people how to learn. And if we don't teach them yeah. how to learn, which happens by questioning, right? Um, questioning was not rewarded in the class, right? right. Um, ex exploring, exploration was not rewarded in school. You were told when you're in ninth grade, you take these subjects and then 10th grade and then like, like there was not really true exploration um, outside of things we were led to believe we're exploring. <laughs> so all that to say, my, my hypothesis is what I truly believe is the way we learn influences the way we think. So as an adult now, just think back to how you were taught to learn, right? Mm -hmm. Growing up mm -hmm. and how that impacted the way you go about life and your reactions to challenges and your habits when it comes to problem solving and making decisions. Uh, most people as adults, including me, I had this realization just a couple of years ago. Most people, including me, want to look at playbooks. We want to look at how to guides, right? We want to go on Udemy. We want to go on all these different things and say, all right, expert or tell me what to yep. do and I will do it because I can take initiative to do it, but you got to tell me what to do. And when things don't work out for people, right? Because even though they followed everything to a T, but it didn't work out. And for most people, that's the case. They start self-blaming. Oh, maybe I didn't do it right. Maybe mm. I'm not good enough. Maybe I'm not smart enough to understand this. Uh, maybe I'm not lucky enough. Maybe I don't have enough money to do this, right? Like that's what the majority of people will think, but they don't think, oh, like maybe that just didn't work for me because I'm just different and right. I need to find my own path and I need to forge my own story. So Edvo is an education technology company. Uh, we have two products that we're actively building. One is a, um, what is called Mental Models by Edvo. And it's a tool to help people think better. It's to help people gain self-confidence in their ability to make decisions, to solve everyday challenges. So for example, something as simple as you're procrastinating, you know, you're just <laughs> motivation to like do something. So how can you avoid procrastination? Open up the Mental Models by Edvo app and find avoiding procrastination as the situation. And when you click into it, we'll tell you here is how to think about it. And here's how to actually avoid procrastination. Here's how to get, find that motivation. And what we're using to help you think through those things is mental models. And mental models are these powerful thinking tools that have existed forever. I mean, <laughs> All of us use mental models, right? Think of mental model is synonymous to your framework of thinking. So everyone has a framework of thinking, right? Yep. But the problem is not all frameworks are equal. <laughs> not all frameworks are healthy and good, but there are quite a few mental models that time and time again have shown to be very helpful and very productive and very good in certain situations. Yet the majority of people in our, in this world have no idea what mental models are, have never even heard of it, or if they've heard of it, they've never been explained in a way that's easy to understand. Right. And the people that introduced me to mental models, this was a while back, were investors. They they use it all the time to make decisions of what to invest in and what not to invest in and how to be better. And um, they swear by that. And you can Google Warren Buffett, you can Google Charlie Munger, you can Google Elon Musk, and you will see articles and articles and articles and blogs on mental models and their examples of it. However, they always talk about in the context of like very specific things. Right. And what I realized through my own personal journey is you can literally apply mental models to anything in life. And so this app is really to help people choose an everyday situation. Again, things like, should I break up with my boyfriend? <laughs> um, you know, like, man, I don't know. Uh, should I, um, you know, with COVID, should I give up my apartment and move in with my parents, mm -hmm. right? Like mm -hmm. hard decisions like that, that you don't know short-term, long-term, what's better for you. And so click on that situation, know which mental models can help you think through it. And mm. then we'll actually help you think through it through like a Q and a that's personal. It's, it's, you know, it's not shared by it with anyone unless you want it to be. Um, and it's just your friend to help you think through anything life throws at you. So that's one of the, um, apps that we're building right now it's in beta mode. So if anyone out there is listening and wants a beta invite, you can just reach out to me. Um, we actually launched on product hunt a few months back with just a really tiny 
prototype and it was you crushed it. Yeah, it was crazy. Yeah, it, was, it just it flew <laughs> and it was yeah, it, it was just so beautiful because it was a passion project for me and my friend and colleague Darlene and it's just Awesome. <laughs> so talk about the talk about the the second sort of product within the, like the yeah, so, environment. Yeah, so the second product, which was you know obviously actually our first product, and it's <laughs> really something that I'm building. I honestly started building it just for myself. Mm -hmm. um, it came from a frustration that I had, and then I just started unlocking magic and realized, holy crap, this can be a game changer. So the product is Edvo and it's a personal learning management system and it's built, intentionally built for lifelong learning. So I talk a lot about lifelong learning being this, like just this trend and this label, right? But this is for people who are very serious about learning <laughs> and being better and, and constantly seeking knowledge and, and just they're curious, right? And so the reason why I started building it is because I'm someone who is always listening to podcasts. I'm someone who is subscribed to so many different Substack newsletters. I read all these articles and I used to use things like Pocket or like, you know, yeah. I love Notion, for example, and I used to save everything there. And, and the problem is like, I, it wasn't really a saving problem. It was more like a, how does this one podcast relate to everything else I'm consuming, mm -hmm. right? How mm -hmm. does this really relate to like my knowledge? And then second, how do I also actually, when I'm consuming a podcast or consuming consuming an article, how do I actually like learn from it? How do I consume it in a meaningful way? Because I found myself just reading articles because I felt this pressure to like know a ton of stuff. So I was just reading a ton of articles and then <laughs> I would give myself a pat on the back and be like, oh cool, like learned a lot today. And then someone would ask me about something the week after and literally I'd be like, I know I read about it, but I cannot tell you what I read, right? Right, right. And so it was about making learning intentional and, and actually productive. So the learning management system is literally something where anything you see, you can save it in one place um, and you can go on a quest to truly dig deeper into any topic you want. So for example, let's say I recently went on a quest on like whether schools should open back up in the fall, right? Around COVID. Right. Uh, a couple of years ago, I went on a quest to learn angel investing, right? And when I'm on this quest, I have a bunch of questions, right? Or maybe I don't, maybe I'm just like, I want to know what, what, like my only question is what is angel investing, right? Right. But um, you go on this quest and everything you consume related to that topic, you can save it really quickly. And then Edvo will guide you using best practices for true understanding, for true retention and for developing an informed perspective, right? Not just taking whatever you read as your truth, but actually asking like, ah, do I agree with this? How does this relate to what I already know? Does it contradict something I believe, right? Actually going through a thoughtful process about things you consume in a very, like, I wouldn't say quick, but in a very um, natural way, yeah. in a very natural way, because we want to build this within your workflow. We don't want this to be a thing you have to do on a weekend, you know, when you make time to learn. It's when you read a news article, whatever, it's just plugged in. You can just take any action you want on it. You can annotate the hell out of it. You can ask questions. You can remind yourself to look this up later and it'll auto save and remind you whenever you want that reminder to come up. So it's this operational learning tool that really powers you up to just learn for the rest of your life and learn anything you want. Um, that's what we're building. And that too, the beta launch is actually this month. We got such incredible feedback from the people in our, obviously our friends and family circles that have used it and are mm -hmm. obsessed with it. Um, but we're launching the beta officially this month. It's going to be an invite only. So Brand, if you obviously want yeah. access to it, let me know. Yep. Um, and then if anyone's listening, they can also ping me um, and I'm happy to share an invite. So that'll be, will it be a, like a, like a Chrome plugin? Is that like, yeah, how it be? Yeah. And it's kind of just safe through, through that, something like that. Yeah. So it's a Chrome extension. You can also, we're building it out in a web app first. So you can obviously save the web app on your phone. So you can always, you can access it on any mobile device. And then it's also its own web app that, you know, you can go to and see an entire dashboard. Yep. And the goal is, you know, we want it to be available on any device you use to learn. And yep. so that is the future for it. I almost, as you say it, I, I'm like, I'm really bad at like reading books because <laughs> i like yeah. my, my attention span is so bad right but like i love the subject matter so like you said i'll instead of like reading a full book by one person i will listen to like a podcast about the same subject exactly. matter from one person or i'll read like blog posts from another person about the same subject matter right so i almost liken it to like reading a book 
where each chapter is written by a different author from their point of view on that subject matter. That's that's learning, right? Like yeah, even if you yeah. choose to read, like I love reading, so I'll read full blown books by one person, but that's not going to dictate my opinion on that topic, right? Right? Then I will, similar to you, go find that podcast, go find that article. Like it's going to happen. And I think my problem is when I don't know where I stand on things because I haven't done a good enough job thinking about them, mm -hmm. and I haven't done a good enough job saying, okay, well, this guy in this book with this background has this stance, but this woman from this background from this podcast has a completely different stance why right and what does that mean for me and my stance that, why like that's learning that's yeah. and you know when you everyone is smart i truly believe everyone is smart but sometimes we get stuck and i think we get stuck because we haven't thought through it deeply enough mm -hmm. And the problem with thinking through deeply is it takes time and it's annoying today, right? Like there's nothing that makes it fun. We are discouraged to go down rabbit holes, right? Because in school and our adulthood, everything's about how fast can you come up with an answer, right? And so we're discouraged to go down rabbit holes, but as someone who has embraced rabbit holes, it is fascinating to see how much context and good information is out there that you can really learn from and then build your own perspective around. And it leads to me having so many more meaningful discussions with people. I swear to I'm 27 years old and the people I talk to, the people I've been able to attract, the people, the dinners I'm a part of, it's unfortunate I'm usually the only woman in those rooms, wow. which is like a completely separate topic, but the conversations I'm having and contributing to, I can only do that because I genuinely have started liking learning. And that yeah. that only happened by me for, for me, it was building the system for myself because before that learning was painful and horrible. I never liked it. I hated, I always hated school. And you know, I know many people feel the same way and I, and yeah. I, I never loved learning ever, you know, it, it was the opposite. Right. And, you know, I really don't know where, I don't know where I can really pinpoint it, where I started to like love learning, but it was definitely because of like the internet, right? It was because I could seek out exactly what I wanted to learn and learn it the way I wanted to learn it, whether it was through a YouTube video, right? Whether it was through a blog post, whether it was through a podcast, Rather than, you know, we, historically, we've only had one way to learn, right? Through like a book, through like text and through this person's iteration of, of whatever subject matter it was. And I think that was just that it didn't invoke like a passion in me for learning, right? It was very, it was taught in a very boring way, right? Which is, is horrible because like educating ourselves and like sparking that inspiration in our minds, is like the biggest pro we have as a human, like that is like such a big factor of like yeah. life. And for that part to be boring is like, it's, it's just really so bad. inefficient, right? Yeah. But to it's make really it bad. interesting and fun is like, that's how we spark millions and billions of people to like love learning, which is the, a game changer obviously. Yeah. And I think the beauty, the result um, of learning, a really strong learning is you start developing confidence in your own ability to find the answers. Right. Right. And that's yeah. what you said. You found the internet and you realized, wow, there's everything here. Um, good, bad, ugly, beautiful. And yeah. You can though go and lead your own journey into finding answers for yourself. And I think I I found that refreshing, but at the same time I found it overwhelming because I was like, well, but like Absolutely. I don't know, like, I can't distinguish between the good and the ugly, right? <laughs> and like, I just I can't. It's like some some of the ugly is so damn convincing. <laughs> it's good. And that's unfortunately the case for a lot of the content you'll see that really pops up first on Google, right? Because they're paying to be there. Mm -hmm. But for me, I've recognized when you start thinking like this, when you start thinking deeply, learning better, thinking better, thinking for yourself, you develop the self agency. And someone asked me on Twitter the other day, um, you know, what's examples of self agency? Like, when do you, when do you know you have self agency? And I said, it's when you start, uh, you don't feel like you, you feel confident asking questions because you don't want to because one, because you're curious, but curiosity doesn't have to do with it as much as you just feel comfortable asking questions and you don't just, you know, you know, we're all in conversations where someone's saying something, I have no idea what they're talking about. So you just nod, right? You're like, <laughs> yeah, totally, I get it. Uh, but self-agency is when you don't nod. 
you know, and, and I'm not saying like, oh, there's sometimes you just don't give a shit and you'll nod along. That's, that's very different than sure. feeling stupid and just nodding mm -hmm. along because you're too embarrassed to speak up, right? So self-agency is when you can speak up for yourself, when everyone seems to believe this one thing, you still speak up and question and say, but why? Like, I just seem to not believe that, but I don't know why I believe, like why I don't believe it. So I'm going to ask. I'm going to, I'm going to explore that. That's self-agency. Self-agency is knowing that you can develop any skill. You can develop any knowledge in order to thrive and live the life you want. That's self-agency. And at Skillify, my biggest, biggest intention was I need these kids to develop self-agency. I need these kids to get out into the real world and see that their value is so much more than their grades and their test scores. And now at Edvo, it's for the world. It's, I need every single human being to realize they have power within themselves and to not sound or, you know, just vague with that, but it's really, you can learn, your body is built to learn. Your brain is built to learn. You are, you can learn anything you want, but we need tools. We need, we need resources. We need support because for so long, we were told that we can't learn anything we want, that we mm -hmm. have to do some things a certain way. So in order to unlearn that and really build new habit loops and new defining new truths for yourself, we all need that tool and that resource. So at Edvo, that's what we're doing now. So I usually like to end on a little bit of the future, what may be goals and sort of missions, you know, you have for yourself or for Edvo for, you know, your life in general for the next sort of three to five years, what, what are some of the successes you want to see or goals you want to reach personally or, or through Edvo or through um, investments that you're making? Anything that is sort of, you know, on top of mind for you that you really want to yeah. commit, commit to and get and get done? Yeah. So uh, being a product person, <laughs> my <laughs> biggest goal, especially at Edvo right now, is I'm building this to bring value to billions of people, right? And I don't say millions. Um, I always say billions because education is a global problem. Thinking is a global universal issue, right? Uh, we all think. So my vision, my goal, my personal and professional is I want to build something that billions of people use, they love, they get value from, they're sharing them. That's how I know that I've truly unlocked something and fulfilled my purpose of bringing something valuable to the world, right? Um, especially in education, because that's, that's my whole being, in my opinion. My second goal, which has always, always been the case, it's part of my personality, is really disrupting the norms of our society, these societal constructs that we've taken as true for so long, including things like, you know, the medication we take, the pharmaceuticals, right? So I'm a big, I have a huge passion for plant medicine. I do a lot of work within the space. So I want to see plant medicine. I want to increase awareness for plant medicine. And I want to do my part in educating people and removing the stigma or really just questioning the stigma, honestly, because right, right. I care less about, frankly, like I have no right to dictate where your opinion is going to be, right? You, you should think whatever you want to think, but please question the stigma and see where it comes from and who and you know what institutions really um propel that forward right so those are like my two big goals which again i think are just the same it's it's related to education it's related right. to thinking for ourselves it's relating to choosing what we wish to believe in and really recognizing what serves us and allows us to be our best people amazing thanks so much for uh taking the time. I'm, uh, I'm inspired by your work you've done so far. I mean, you still has such a, such a long way to go, but I mean, man, in, in the 27 years you've been here, you've, you've accomplished a, a hell of a lot and it's, uh, incredibly just impressive and inspirational. So, you know, everything you're doing, keep doing it, please. Uh, keep, keep just inspiring others and keep building impactful products that, you know, hopefully can inspire people and spark something inside other people's brains to, to kind of really do what they want to do and take a leap maybe and just keep learning and keep learning. Rabbit holes can be very good. <laughs> Going down rabbit holes can be can be very powerful and profound. Uh, we just need systems and platforms in place that help us em embrace those rabbit holes a little better and, and maybe uh, take more out of it than we, we currently do when we go down those rabbit holes. But best of luck the rest of this year and obviously for, for years to come. Appreciate it.